nepotism just rampant. What's Hollywood? What are we talking about? Is this possible? He talks about Section 31 out in the open. And he can't sign off on this if Scotty doesn't know. But it's really bothering me that this is red. Today we're back in the Star Trek universe watching Into Darkness in the Kelvin timeline. What did you think about today's movie? Uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, I give it a 6 out of 10. I did not feel things in this movie like I did in the 2009 original version. Just that one felt more flying by the seat of my pants, characters growing, things happening. Here, I didn't feel it as much. That's primarily why I knock it down to a 6 out of 10. Uh, there's some other problems like Khan felt overpowered. A lot of the plot points felt kind of contrived. Um, Kirk and Spock's character growth didn't hit as hard for me. In the first one, it felt like, you know, they're going from high school to academy to captain. Big movements in character. Here, I didn't feel it as much. Um, the fact that the USS Vengeance took out a whole city, that was felt understated. That's kind of huge. Uh, the movie kind of dragged at the end. I did like the acting. Uh, and I wanted to see the five-year mission, which we never really actually get to see in this trilogy. So that was kind of a disappointment. Overall, it's a solid entrance into the Kelvin timeline, but for me, 6 out of 10. What did you think? I gave this movie a 7 out of 10. So first thing, Khan being overpowered. I mean, I guess that's the point of Khan, right? He is like this genetically modified eugenics human. It's super strong, super awesome. And so, but, but clearly like eugenics bad. Like we don't want to be doing eugenics, all sorts of societal and personal problems. I'm not good. But when Khan took out like a hundred Klingons more or less by himself, I was like, eugenics, eugenics good. Like actually maybe like something to think about for when humanity's out in space. And I did like the character arcs for Spock and Uhura specifically. You really see how like they both have their where they start, they have problems and they overcome the problems. Really good character arcs for those two specifically. And um, there was some growth for Sulu and and Chekhov. They like be, they have become more important in the ship, but ne not necessarily the hero's journey where they have some some negative trait that they have to overcome. Um, that being said, I really did like the relationship between Spock and Kirk. They they they're clearly set up from the beginning of. Kirk is flying by the seat of his pants and Spock follows the rules. And then by the end, they figure out, oh, we need to work together. Actually, our friendship is what's really important. Super good, super good. I like that plot point. But Kirk by himself, I'm not really sure that he had a character arc. He's flying by the seat of his pants, making decisions that are, are, are haphazard. And by the end, I don't think any of that bites him in the butt. I think it actually is proven that's just, just what he should do more of. Um, but maybe maybe there was some humbling in there even though that i mean he, he's the main character he wins in the end but maybe there was some humbling when he went to 1v1 versus khan and really got his ass handed to him um, maybe also when he went against uss vengeance and he's like i'm powerless in this situation um but he also scraps it together and makes it out by the end of the day um there are some sin there are also some scenes that really feel forced um feels plotty feels like 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 this character's motivation from what we've seen them before doesn't make sense that they do this, but I, I get it because the scene needs to happen so that the story makes sense. Uh, but it, it takes me out of it. It, it feels uh, it's very uncomfortable to have this like meta analysis going on. But still, still Star Trek and Kelvin timeline. The actors are super fun. The, the, the movie is like dynamic and flashy and exciting. It's a summer blockbuster, seven out of 10. Okay, one thing I'd like to say is I do see the character development in the movie. I just didn't feel it for whatever reason mm. as much. I didn't feel it as much as I did in the first one. The first one, I'm like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, like yeah, I'm in it. And this Dramatic. one, I'm like along for the ride, but I'm not immersed as much as I am for the first one. I can't explain why, but it's a lot more subtle. A lot, it's mm -hmm. a lot less clear of where the characters are going. Right. Yeah, for me, it was right at the end where when Spock says, like, oh, we've never been on a five-year mission before, so there's no rules here, so I'll follow your lead. Like, F Spock mm -hmm. stopped fighting Kirk, and Kirk's like, fly by the seat of your pants. Right. And, uh, and Kirk, yeah, acknowledges Spock, and he's like, yeah, I should listen to you. Yeah. Now well, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So this is after the red planet. I guess all the plants on that planet are red. And Kirk saves Spock after he sets off the cold fusion device violating the prime directive he gets a dressing down by pike let's watch 
Do you have any idea what a pain in the ass you are? I think so, sir. So tell me what you did wrong. What's the lesson to be learned here? Never trust a Vulcan. Oh, so you can't even answer the question. You lied <laughs> on an official report. Think the rules don't apply to you because you disagree with them. Wait, hold on, hold on. Talk on. He, he lied on an official report. In real life, how often do official reports and reality diverge? <laughs> I think it's pretty much every single time. Pretty much always. Even if like, you have a bad result or something, you write it in a way that it's actually like a net positive. Right. And let's say something is wildly complicated. You want to mm -hmm. distill it down to its basics. You could call that lying or you could call that succinctness, but... I mean, Gosh. if you don't make it succinct, you make it overly flowery and descriptive, then it's like people are like, why are you writing this flowery stuff? Just get, get me the information. Right. Are you trying to like lie to me through obscuring what really happened? Cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. But then if you cut to the chase... You're missing details. I think they have to diverge a lot. And it is, is Pike saying that Kirk is directly lying? I guess. I guess he, like, if I remember Pike, you know, Kirk admits a lot of stuff. He like, fully just doesn't acknowledge it. Right. Hmm. So the accusation is almost always true but he's saying you're lying in like a very direct way in a in an egregious way in a too much yeah. way yeah ah so so really just kirk is not calibrated to lie the appropriate amount that's that's right so it's a calibration issue not a dishonesty issue right but kirk is calibrated to what has been successful for him that's true i think i think they go on and talk about it. let's see Signing up in the first place. It's why you gave me your I ship. I gave you my ship because I saw greatness in you. And now I see you haven't got an ounce of humility. What would you have nope. done? I wouldn't have risked. He just doesn't have an ounce of humility at all. Why would he? He's been firing on all cylinders for right. years. He's been an absolute <laughs> hotshot since he got into Starfleet. And every maybe potential misstep that he made turned out, oh, I'm getting promoted. Oh, I'm getting a ship. Oh, I'm, I'm getting, you know, speech speaking engagements in front of people like praise mm. promotions Ooh. what yeah this dressing down felt weird to me as well because kirk has been flying by the seat of his pants doing wild stuff and looking for his leaping in fact in fact looking before he's leaping is exactly why pike wanted him and so he he does all these behaviors that are super risky and super not thought out but very successful and he's been praised his entire career for it and then pike is coming in here and saying like this this wasn't good it feels like it feels like you're you're talking to a Formula One driver and you're like you're driving too fast, but it's like that that's what that's what you like about me, right? That's why I'm in the car. Let's continue. Also, also does Pike does Pike give Kirk the Enterprise? If I remember, if I remember from <laughs> Star Trek 2009, mm -hmm. Pike was in a wheelchair and like unable to be a captain. Mm -hmm. And he's he's not Starfleet Command. He's not like handing out like here's a ship, or, here's a ship, you get a ship, like <laughs> like. Yeah, he gave up his command, but it wasn't like he... He's probably ordered to by whoever's higher than him. Right, it's not like Pike can say, I want my ship to go to this guy. No, that has to be decided by Starfleet committees and, like, personnel people. Yeah. Based on... He can request it. He can request Yeah, he can recommend But ship request assignments it. come up from someone. I don't know, not him. <laughs> no way is he just like, yeah, this is... Here's the keys. Can you no imagine way. the corruption that would happen oh. and all the reports that he would misfile to make it happen? <laughs> Yeah, people start handing out ships to their buddies. People yeah. start handing out ships to their family. Mm -hmm. It would be a nightmare. It's nepotism just rampant. What's Hollywood? What are we talking about? My first <laughs> officer's life in the first place. You were supposed to survey a planet, not alter its destiny. You've wait, wait, wait. He, he dodged the question there. Hey, let's see it. First no. officer's life in the... Wait, wait, wait. So, so Kirk says, what would you have done? You haven't mm -hmm. got an ounce of humility. What would you have done? I wouldn't have risked my first officer's life in the first place. You were supposed to survey a planet, not alter its destiny. You violated a dozen Starfleet regulations and almost got everyone under your command killed. Except I didn't. You know how many crew members I've lost since I That's the your problem. Sure, you think one. you're infallible. Not one. You think you can't make a mistake. It's a pattern with you. The rules are for other people. Some should and be. And what's worse Some is you're using be. blind luck to justify your playing God. Okay, so there's two things. Mm -hmm. Kirk asks, what would you have done in the situation? The situation is you're observing this alien planet and there's a volcano. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to die in there unless you do something. And Pike says, well, I wouldn't have been there. 
Like, <laughs> this, this, this is in, not the it, scenario. In, in some sense, he's not dodging the question because he's saying the lead up to the situation was poor. But on the other hand, he's dodging the question because he's saying, well, if you had to choose between the prime directive and saving crew members, which one are you going to pick? So he said he dodged that part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you can't always control the situation you get into oh um, interesting i interpreted it as if if you're the captain you're flying around in your uss whatever ship and you see a civilization that's guaranteed going to die unless i do something mm -hmm. in principle prime directive you just let them right right but but isn't that against the idea of watching life flourish so what do you what do you do what do you do captain pike and pike's like mm just wouldn't be there at all which is right you don't have to think about it if you're not there at all that's right i guess if you are there and you survey this coming extinction level event mm -hmm. you just let it happen and therefore you're not in breach of any code of conduct oof that's the bad side of exploration but i guess but, that is the moral issue you have to tackle but i guess is the prime directive can you like say there's an asteroid heading toward a planet can starfleet divert it and say okay we didn't want them to die so let's divert it they didn't know it got diverted as long as we do it in secret it's not a violation of the prime directive is that right i think or that is, is right i think i've seen episodes of that so kirk was trying to stop the volcano in secret so that's not a violation it really was going to get spock made them get got and then caught yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no, nobody died but they got caught right. so that was the issue so you, the <sighs> answer right? can't be just don't get in trouble don't get in don't go into danger like that's not make better decisions on the run-up like yes but it's also dodging the question but is so is if you protect a civilization from an extinction level event is that and you don't get caught by them like in the moment yeah is that a guarantee that they won't you know a thousand years in the future develop enough science and be like wait a minute here's records that we should have had an extinction level event wait but we didn't ah is there aliens then and then they're, they're, they're speculating about you anyway like like if if they can figure out why did mount vesuvius not explode wait a minute it should have exploded oh wait so there must have been interference now they're like now they're viewing you as a religion anyway Okay, so I'm going to dodge this question because Good. <laughs> Good. in a way, we can't predict volcanic activity in earthquakes right now. So maybe the science for earthquakes and volcanoes is so advanced that you're essentially warp level technology anyway at that point. So that rite of passage for predicting and looking back in history for volcano, volcano eruption, volcanic eruptions is so advanced that you're essentially at warp tech anyway. It's not that a problem. Right. Yeah, that's but, a good answer. But that dodges the question of what if what if they could notice alien influence much earlier than warp tech? Now mm -hmm. you have a problem because they're going to notice that alien influence was there, but they're not at that warp threshold yet. And that could cause problems. Mm. So maybe volcanoes, okay, but pollution, not okay. Like miraculous cleaning of the oceans, <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, hmm. Oxygen coming from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Which is actually a real thing that just they just discovered. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> maybe it's aliens. <laughs> maybe it's aliens. Yeah. So this is in the medical facility where this guy I don't remember his name is taking care of his daughter. Uh, he inserts a little vial into the super high tech Starfleet medical device doesn't sit right with me okay, this is con's blood. blood right this is con's, con yeah con's blood it's it's superhuman it blood his daughter yeah. daughter look at it look at it look at can't i <gasps> uh, can't unsee it why is this one nice and straight the one he just put in is all crooked it's crooked it's crooked <sighs> i mean I'm i want it to be like a like a, a, like a chink yeah yeah a positive like detent like pop in there like for sure right. it's collected clocked in what right. if this isn't just seated right it's like crooked and then it falls out and there's blood all over the ground that's right 
because I mean, I'm not weird. a phlebotomist, uh, but I have had my blood taken a, a few times, and it feels like like mm-hmm. secure connections. And it's none of this like the vial is plugged in, but it's mm-hmm. slightly crooked. Like it feels like it's going to fall out. There'll be blood all over the ground. Right. If you're dialing in dosages and you've got leaks because it's not, you know, it's not engaged properly with the device, you got problems. I mean, heck, how is he going to measure the meniscus? It's crooked. It's crooked. Not going to get a good reading. That's right. So on one hand, it's is it user error, or is it bad design on the machine, where it could be it could get get inserted all cockeyed. So I guess it's both. But if you have good design, then there's no room for user error. Right. Like it's either it's either clearly not in, engaged or clearly engaged and properly engaged. There's no like I can sort of force it in and it's all cockeyed, and it's sort mm. of working but sort of not. Not good. I think it's bad design. Most I'm gonna say seventy five percent bad design, twenty five percent user error. That's what I'm going with. I'm gonna go with eighty five to ninety five because look at these glass look at these look at these glass bottles here. Why why are they yeah. why are they hanging out right at head level? He like bends down to hug his kid and then he stands up and you like break this glass, break yeah. this glass, and now there's like glass all over the ground, like nurse, like help <laughs> glass all over the ground. That's right, because if you're like hugging your loved one and you get back up, dink and it's, it's, it's like right there. Like code blue, code blue. They've lost fluids. Like, uh, why, why was this dangling and made of glass? <laughs> I mean, it's it's good. Like reuse, recycle, reuse. I said reuse mm-hmm. twice, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, make this out of plastic. Or if it has to be glass for this shape is somehow critical, mm-hmm. protect it. Put in a, yep. put it away. Put it at a not head level. <laughs> Yeah, put it in a in a cabinet back here, right? So that it's yeah. So you need a secondary container so that you mm-hmm. knock into the container without knocking into the glass. So mm-hmm. this yeah, I, I now I'm now bumping it up to ninety five percent. All kinds of bad design all over the place. Let's see what else. Is Starfleet okay. Starfleet okay. Yeah, this yeah this Starfleet okay. <laughs> yeah, this uh, I feel like if there's a, a, a if there were market forces, this engineering problem would be fixed. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, crooked, weird. Oh, crooked. <sighs> I don't Can't like unsee. Okay, so after the attack and at this thing, after this uh, this guy sets off a bomb, then mm-hmm. Kirk is called into Starfleet, and there are guards there, and so they're mm-hmm. on high alert. But my thought is maybe they should be like this all the time. I mean, just a few guys, a couple of rifles situationally you know like strategically around Mm -hmm. so my thought was starfleet is about exploration it's about science but we don't know what other alien species temperaments Mm -hmm. will be like we don't know if for example when we encountered the changeling i mean we like encounter okay in star in star trek when they encountered changelings then changelings spent sent spies to sabotage from the inside like you don't know what alien threats may be out there in which case shouldn't we have this type of security just kind of all the time so I think I'm pro security. I'm a little confused as to whether this is a secure area or not. We got we got like captains and important people oh. roaming around, and yet these guys are ready for a firefight. It seems either secure the room and have free movement, or have it be like a checkpoint and like getting people moving through until it's secure. This so kind of feels like. Half you're saying at like a, at like national laboratories, there's like the front gate, you know, badge yeah. in, and when they're checking you, uh, oh yeah, what am I doing national? It's like at the airport, <laughs> like you yeah. get past the TSA line, and then you're free to do whatever you want. But up until then, before then, you're you're an unknown to people. That's right. So so maybe there's a door out here, there or a gate, but it looks like mm-hmm. people just teleport in and they just walk in. So this, I think, this is an unsecure or insecure, unsecure. This is a not secured area. Right, so then I'm I'm unhappy with this security because I want the captains and the important people to get through this area quickly. Because if I have to do a firefight and these people are hanging around, like I'm in trouble. Like I can't just. Oh, uh, so you're saying you're saying that these guards should be like, go about your business. Like we just had a terrorist attack on the other side mm-hmm. of of the planet, but it's the Starfleet yeah. stuff. So so like get. Get the area clear so that if there's a bad person, he can't just mill around with you and make it look like they're supposed to be there. Right. No, 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 get out of here. So, yeah, so that's like this like grouping right here of important mm-hmm. people. That conversation, let's get that upstairs. 
Yeah, you guys are going to talk anyway. Go go to the secure yeah. place. At the same time, you're saying shapeshifters, the Dominion, which I, they're not mm -hmm. in this. They haven't found them yet. Sure. But they could be anywhere. So you mm -hmm. need armed up people sort of everywhere. Yeah, or heck, even if it was Klingons, Klingons like come in and like rapid, rapid descend, crash landing, and like hop out, and start fighting. You don't want these security guards to be somewhere else at where the actual gate was. Like you need people nearby so that they can mm -hmm. collapse, collapse quickly if they have to. I see. So we want full police state, just police everywhere, rifles, military equipment everywhere, rolling heavy down the streets. So they're always mm -hmm. ready mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for anything. Every person is a part of the police state. Everybody mm -hmm. should have phaser rifles mm -hmm. at all times. Mm -hmm. There is no police group. It's just everyone. Right. In fact, that guy right there you're pointing at, he's going to yep. snitch right now on his, his neighbor. That's right. Because he's he's all about he, that safety. He's, he's watching. He's <laughs> Everyone's watching <laughs> to make sure they <laughs> behave appropriately. Hi alert, yes. But I, I mean, okay. But there's some degree of this of Starfleet is super naive. They're like, let's just all be friends with everyone out there. Like some people right. aren't, aren't going to be that. Right, gosh, it would be hard not to be a militarized state with the fear of all these other species. Whew. So this is in the meeting where they're discussing John Harrison and Kirk is sort of seeing the scene of the terrorist attack using this. He's sort of navigating the 3D space. Is this tech even possible? Just leaving the system so we know he can't be far. So sort of zooming in, but then he's able to like, navigate it in 3D. Even see details in 3D? Like oh, cameras are 2D. Cool. Is this possible? Maybe. So so it's similar to, to how you can do like a not motion capture. Say if you have like a figurine, like a, like mm -hmm. a, like a, like a, What's this? Uh, like a Gundam model, and you want to make mm -hmm. a 3D model of it. You put it on this rotating stand, and you have a camera that like mm -hmm. pictures, picture, 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 and then all the pictures together, you can make a composite image as like a 3D image. Mm -hmm. So, the technology for this, I think, is almost already here. Like, I think it's mm -hmm. already there. Like, if you, and good point that that these are these people are not rotating; they're just doing their business, whatever it is. And so, how would you get these other angles? But I think if you had enough cameras just around, um, maybe in like a police state, there's like a bunch of cameras from all over sorts of angles, then all together you could make these these images like this. So I guess if you have complete camera coverage, which even in a police state I think would be a challenge, um, you're going to get fairly good images by directly translating the camera coverage into 3D models. Wouldn't you need to fill in some blanks though? Wouldn't there be like places where it's not, their details are not clear or even just dark zones where the cameras can't see because of a blockage? Good point. Um, Good point. So say for example, if whatever camera that used to be there is damaged, mm -hmm. then there's no angle on the side, the left side of con space, mm -hmm. in which case, yeah, I guess you AI fill in, you fill in right. with what you're expecting to see on this mm -hmm. side. Yeah, I think that's I think that's extremely doable. But then, if you're t if you're looking for intelligence and you've got this like mixed actual data and also AI guessing, you're not going to be able to tell which one like what's real, that's what's super, not. Super dangerous. Because mm -hmm. it looks like there's no holes in the coverage, which I'm thinking is AI fill in. Mm. So is that serial number there on that bag? Is that for real or is that just a random number? The AI is like there should be a serial number there. That's right. Once you start getting AI involved, you don't know if the recreation is real. Yeah, maybe maybe you can toggle it on and off, like toggle AI guessing, toggle off AI guessing. And anything when the toggle is off, it's like, this yeah, I is guess for that's, real. I guess that would be the midway trainer when you're like training AI to see mm -hmm. is it doing realistic stuff? You toggle on, toggle off. Mm -hmm. If like a bristle flag pops up, you're like, mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you made that up AI. Super cool though. I think yeah, we're almost cool. we're almost we're here almost actually. There. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, also cool because then if you can make these three D maps, you're ready to throw on a VR. You could experience whatever it's being like. I mean, okay, maybe not with the explosions, but like the the London wheel. That that'd be cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, even just you could throw on a pair of VR goggles and recreate the terrorist explosion for 
intelligence and investigation purposes, that would be cool. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you're like training people how to keep calm in a in a situation, yeah, and like how to well, deal with whatever the explosion. And you could, I guess you could I make even, it like a training, a triage training. Yeah, yeah, training. I think would be good. Also, the yeah. investigation, like where's the source of the explosion? Ah, where did okay. where this debris flew this way? Like, I, I feel like there would be lots of stuff to re. So forensic stuff. Yeah, forensic stuff. That's that's the right word. Okay, and then this is Kirk. He interrupts a meeting, and this looks like a high-level meeting with high-level people. He just rolls in, yells at people, and the meeting is adjourned. Like, what? Security Admiral, detail, sir, he's not on Earth. He's on Kronos, sir. I request my command be reinstated and your permission to go after him. Give us a minute. Kronos. Yes, sir. So Harrison's gone to the Klingon homeworld. Is he defecting? Uh, we're not sure, He sir. has taken refuge in the Ketha province, a region uninhabited uh, for He's got to be hiding there, sir. He knows if we even go near Klingon space, it'd be all out war. Starfleet can't go after him, but I can. <laughs> that guy. Yeah, so this, this is a room full of... Okay, so here's... This is Admiral clothing, five stars, yeah. but this white white shirt for yeah. sure. One there, another one there, maybe here, but certainly a lot of dark shirts, but they're uniformed yeah. up, so they're either... They're either commander or or captain, <clears throat> and then Kirk rolls in dirty, <laughs> like, yeah. dirty wearing un, un insignia. You have no idea yeah. what rank he is, yep. and then he's like, "I have something important." And so then, and so then, um, Marcus cancels the meeting. And look at all this. Yeah, this guy like stands up at attention. <laughs> Marcus <laughs> is already gone. Like I'm not saluting you. And then I mean, creep a little isn't Mark? Isn't look Marcus just? Oh yeah, this guy. Look at him. Look at this guy. Like, side eye. Look at that side eye. He's like this guy again <laughs> like this guy causes so much trouble i mean isn't mark admiral marcus is disrespecting everyone at that table he's like i can dismiss yeah. you like i worked really hard to become an admiral i think my opinions matter and you're just dismissing me because you feel like it how about i don't like you anymore how about i don't like kirk anymore Starfleet like I, politics like come back at 205 when the meeting is over Kirk, yeah, take a bathroom break. <laughs> I or mean, at least Marcus can be like everyone else. Give me two minutes. Stay here. You're, everyone else's time is important. I mean, yeah, these these are high ranking people. How difficult was it to get them in the same room? Right, because if you okay, so there's like five important people and then five support staff. Mm -hmm. So you got to get five important people calendars synced up for the next for the new meeting to finish mm -hmm. this one we had already started. Mm -hmm. That is tough because people go off on deployment. People have got work to do in other buildings, other places. So I've got to get all the calendars synced up again. This could be weeks or could be weeks before somebody annoying can make this meeting happen again. I'd be so mad. I'd Although, be so mad. I will say maybe these high ranking people know about the Section 31 stuff. And so when Kirk and Spock roll in with no insignia, they're like, like ooh, like black black op stuff. Like I, I don't want to be here. I like I don't want to be here. Like you come in, like I'm I'm gone. So all you gotta do is roll around in like your black gym wear, and people are like, <gasps> yep, section thirty one. Yep. Oh my god, section thirty one. Which Maybe. means it's it's not a secret. It's <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like a secret amongst people. That wouldn't really wouldn't know, but the, I guess these people are high enough to know. I don't know. This is also a weird meeting room. It is a very weird meeting. This room. Looks like open air and then a stairwell, like a big ramp. That means whoever's whoever's downstairs, whoever's upstairs, mm -hmm. can hear this conversation. Super weird. And having so yeah, so up and down the sound is traveling. Also, mm -hmm. there's windows, so somebody with Stars. a telescope or something could look into the meeting through the windows, and a person who knows things could surmise a lot about the meeting just from right. looking through the windows um, this is a very <laughs> insecure space <laughs> yeah so is starfleet okay that the like going out into space was so easy and prosper prosperous and that they didn't think about the bad things could happen now they're trying to play catch up yeah trying to play catch up and they're just they're really naive up. about a lot of things which is okay. I mean, that's kind of a that, that's a reasonable stage for mm -hmm. human exploration to go through. It's just mm -hmm. we're seeing it. Yeah. And I think the the yes. next one is Admiral Marcus. He talks about Section Thirty One 
out yeah. in the open. Just way out in the open. I get... It's crazy. London was not an archive. It was a top secret branch of Starfleet designated Section 31. Section 31 is supposed to be super secretive. It's black ops. It's like, it's it's the antith antithesis. It's anti thema to mm -hmm. this peace and exploration. It's like, no, we do dark stuff. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be super secret. But here, Admiral Marcus is talking about it in that cavernous room. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing is, as far as I understand in Deep Space Nine, Section 31 was created to take care of the few getting your hands dirty things that Starf that the Federation needed to do so yeah. that Starfleet and the government could have its hands clean. So yeah. I don't think Starfleet or the government is even supposed to know. It's completely outside right. of the hierarchy of Starfleet. Right. That was my understanding as well. That that way Starfleet would have complete plausible deniability. Like we don't have that organization. It's, it's right. Section 31 runs in secret, completely secret. Right. Like you're not and supposed to know about this. And they do like a few like key, uh, like, sabotage things right. here and there right to ensure that starfleet can stay on top of its idealistic if you, game if you do too many actions people start connecting the dots so it needs right. to be really subtle and really infrequent right and so the fact that adam marcus who's in starfleet knows about section 31 and is mentioning out in the open means kelvin timeline section 31 is toast like it cannot do right. what it's supposed to do so that's a good point because it's Kelvin timeline and Kelvin mm -hmm. timeline humanity has experienced a lot of threat, like al yeah. almost, almost completely destroyed. So maybe section 31 ramps up and they're like, you know, we're, we're here, we're going to do some bad stuff. And then section 32 is the one that's the really <laughs> secret. It's just layers of sections. <laughs> 30, 31.4, like that type of thing. Oh, like, didn't not, think it would be a Not point. even an integer, right? Yeah, 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 yeah right. <laughs> section pi, like, oh, didn't see mm. that one coming. Mm. Actually, that's a decent way to hide it. Yeah, except if they like type in they type in their name and it's like a non-repeating number <laughs> <It> just <laughs> overflows every entry box yeah. yeah how many decimal points are in your name for your section i got up, up to five decimal points i've oh, been infinite. trying to log okay. in but i can never finish <laughs> <laughs> then i was admiral marcus's plan that he explains to kirk there's kind of two levels to it. One is he's explaining it to Kirk to get Kirk to do some stuff. But then there's also the the underhanded thing, which is Admiral Marcus's plan to get the Klingon war begun, started. Does it work? Providence where it's... Harrison is hiding is uninhabited. Affirmative, sir. Part of our defensive strategy. 31 developed a new photon torpedo. Long range and untraceable. It would be invisible to Klingon oh, sensors. Wait, wait, does that... Wait, this is a secret meeting. He's talking about right. Section 31 long range... Photon to be look right. how cavernous this place is. I know. So you got you got people on different levels that can see what's going on. You got windows yeah, yeah. so people can see what's having going on. Mm -hmm. The sound is traveling. The only way this makes sense to me is if you can guarantee that there is nobody else in this room. The way you guarantee that there's nobody else in this room is that this room is only for you. This is Marcus's office. I mean, it's possible. It's just the Dang. level of difficulty. <laughs> That's a <laughs> this office it is you want to talk about corner office uh-uh like, i have I a, a multi-story <laughs> gosh okay yeah, but back to his plan let's listen to what he mm -hmm. says the klingon sensors i don't want you hurt but i want to take him out you park on the edge of the neutral zone you lock on to harrison's position you fire you kill him and you haul ass so as far as I understand, Kirk is all emotioned up right now, and he wants to go yeah. kill Harrison yeah. because Harrison killed Pike. Pike, Pike, his mentor, his father figure. Mm -hmm. So Kirk doesn't care. He'll just blow up anything to yep. kill Harrison because he's got like rage on his mind. Vengeance. But vengeance, yeah. So he's being kind of dumb and naive. Mm -hmm. Marcus is exploiting that so that Kirk will fire tor photon torpedoes at the Klingons starting the war. Evil and clever, yeah. He is relying a lot on Kirk's boneheadedness in this situation. There are complications. Like, it's uninhabited, this section of Kronos. Like, can we get a confirm Do you know on that? that? Do you know that? It's not, it's not, only, not only is it is, is Marcus's statement to Kirk that it's uninhabited, it's, it's this portion of Kronos will be uninhabited by the time you get there. 
Like you don't you don't know if someone's going out for like a hike or whatever. Like you, you don't know that. Right. And when when they, when we actually get there later in the movie, there's like a city. There's like mm-hmm. infrastructure. It's and like all kind of falling apart. Ready to rock. Yeah, and there could be homeless people. There could be vagrants. That's right. There could be That's all right. kinds of people. So mm-hmm. I don't know how they confirm that. Also, Admiral Marcus says that the torpedoes are undetectable. Like, what? How do they? 100%? Do, you, do you have a Klingon? Do you have current ed, current cutting edge Klingon technology that will know that that you could then use to measure to see if these are undetectable? I don't think so. I think they're, so they're, right. they probably have some intelligence about Klingon sensors, but to have this like, a sh- like certainty. you're so sure about it, you're sure is yeah the certainty. It seems too much. Kirk is blowing through these problems left and right. There's probably more. Is yeah, Kirk- gosh. heck. I mean, but Spock is also there. Spock is supposed to be super analytical and he should be dealing with these probabilities saying like, saying this portion of Kronos is 95% uncertain, like empty. Um, this is also blowing past, blowing past Spock. That's right. He should have brought this up in the moment right now. Like we shouldn't Maybe be doing this. that's how Marcus got to be Admiral. He's just, he's very convincing. <laughs> he's just a people person going to the top. Yeah. Knows how to charm, knows mm-hmm. the strategy, knows how to pull people's emotional lovers. Mm-hmm. And since he can recognize that a Vulcan is emotionally compromised, even though outwardly stones. So he's manipulating two people in the moment to get his plan done. Marcus, goddamn. That's Starfleet potential right there. That's, <laughs> that's Starfleet talent. That's right. But what did you want to say about the the ostensible mission versus the covert mission? So, okay, yeah. So Admiral Marcus is telling Kirk the mission is to go kill John Harrison, who ends up being Khan. Correct. That's that's the ostensible mission. Mm-hmm. And then the underhanded mission is Marcus wants to disable Kirk's ship on in on the border of Klingon space and get caught firing torpedoes at the Klingons, mm-hmm. which starts the war. Mm-hmm. I think. I think that's the, the underhanded that's exactly mission. Right. Right. So he's manipulating Kirk and Spock into doing this so they start a war Mm -hmm. and then marcus has the dreadnought ships being manufactured Mm -hmm. to take on the klingons right there actually i think think right there's a super secret right there yeah (laughs) it's got a bottle yeah (laughs) yeah gosh it's right there gosh okay but good strategy right Mm -hmm. marcus pulls it off he he almost except for a misjudgment in kirk's character he almost pulled it off almost pulled it off yeah kirk eventually does second guess himself but mm. mm-hmm. yeah but otherwise the plan uh man if kirk if kirk was not emotionally compromised he really should be seeing some red flags in this plan it is Seriously, cockamamie yeah. it is really <laughs> it's flying by the seat of your pants yeah. hoping for everything to just work out mm-hmm. uh, this scene so kirk pressures scotty to sign off on these torpedoes and scotty doesn't want to sign off on the torpedoes and signatures mean something you kirk forces right. scotty to quit so that he can move somebody in position to sign the document like it, it's he's, it's part of scotty's job to know what the dangers are on the ship and he can't sign off on this if scotty doesn't know Mr. Scott, I understand your concerns, but we need these torpedoes on board. No specs, no signature. Captain. Sign for the torpedoes, that's an order. Right, well, you leave me no choice but to resign my duties. Oh, come on, Scotty. You it's accept time. my resignation or not? I do. I do. Are you okay? Fine, thank you, Lieutenant. Actually, Scott has just quit. You are the one who quit. You made me quit. <laughs> it's so bad. Like. I'm going to make my engineer sign off on things so I know we're in fighting shape, everything's good to go. But as soon as mm-hmm. I disagree with the signature, you're fired. In fact, when I talk to other people, I didn't fire you. You quit. It's your fault. That's not you fair. Sh- that's, that's not fair at all. It also diminishes the power of the signature. The signature right. is the engineer putting a stamp on it saying this is safe and ready. Right. If he doesn't believe a- that, what the heck? 
this is a real thing. So so engineers they when they, when they sign their signatures on whatever design documents, mm-hmm. it's been it, it's a statement of I as a professional engineer have signed on this. It is good. It is safe. It is repeatable. It's strong. What, whatever they're designing for. Right. And so then they they pay a lot of money and do a lot of training for these credentials so that they when they sign it something it's it's a, an approval that means something. It's like it's not yep. just a kid saying their name. Like it's 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 a real. This has been mm-hmm. approved by whatever our our, our current mm-hmm. understanding of engineering is and so i really like this about scotty he's like sticking to his guns like this is my professional legitimacy if i if i i can't just say yes to something i'm not unaware about and then kirk does this clever but <laughs> awful it, like this corporate thing where they're like you're not going to do it okay you're fired who's next you're not going to do it okay you're fired who's next you're going to do it okay you you approved but right. then when things go wrong then they're like, oh, this is some underling. He signed off and he shouldn't have because he didn't know what he's doing. But, right. but you created this situation where that's his only choice. Mm-hmm. I think I think corporate people do this all the time. They're like, fired because you didn't sign off. Fired because you didn't sign off. And then sign. And then it's a problem. I'm trying to think of an example. Like, Why'd you sign it? You shouldn't have done that. Like, yeah, shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have signed it, even though I fired everybody who didn't sign it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, and then the wild thing, the wild thing is when when he's later on, when Kirk's later on is like, "Well, you quit. It wasn't me. It was you quit." Like, that's mischaracterizing it. Like, no, 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 no. Right. If if I'm a doctor and I refuse to do a surgery for safety reasons because I made the call, and they're like, "You're fired. You're fired. You're out of here." Next doctor up. I also refuse to do the surgery. You're fired. The next doctor comes up. Sure, I'll do it. I'll get paid. Right. And then when something goes wrong, the family sues the hospital. You're like, but the family made, they kept firing doctors until they got a right. yes person. I mean, it's, that, it's like, it's you, you, let's think about the, the logical progression. It's you select for personalities that are willing to do things that are unsafe. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you have a, if you have a helicopter pilot and it's like, yeah. I don't feel comfortable flying in this weather. It's it's against FAA regulations. You're not supposed right. to fly. Well, then you're fired. And like, well, then you get the next one. It's like, no, you're fired. Like, well, I'm a celebrity. I want to fly. Then you eventually you get down to the pilots that are like, I'll do it. Yeah, sure. I'll, right. I'll send it. Sure. So but you're filtering. That's not for, a safe person. Right. That's not safe. You're either filtering for risk takers or pushovers. And those are not in a lot of powerful positions where signatures mean something. You do not want those you people. Want which means people who have power have to accept their signature or lack of signature when when they hear no there's a professional reason for the no gotta respect it gotta respect it so kirk here is really really out of line Mm -hmm. he's not only does not only does he order scotty to do the signature he then characterizes scotty's resignation as him quitting as if he's just a quitter he's a quitter like awful it's awful this is terrible on kirk absolutely terrible gosh it's like truck drivers if if so they like the they have incentives to get the deliveries on time maybe even early Mm -hmm. but so then you push the drivers to go faster and work in harsher conditions but then when they're like this is too harsh i'm falling asleep with the wheel i almost had an accident today like i can't do this then you're like well you quit but you put me in a situation where quitting is the only good option. The only, the only option. You're like, well, he just he didn't want to drive his truck. He's a, he's lazy. Like he didn't have the right mm-hmm. stuff. Actually, we have regulations about how much time behind the wheel we have, how much brake mm-hmm. we need to have, and all these different things. And you're asking me to violate it. And now you're characterizing it as quitting. This is this is totally unfair. Mm. Slander, Kirk. Okay, in this same sequence, Scotty is very, he's, he's not happy that they're taking military weapons. Although I think in the Starfleet universe, every, in, in ours, every ship that goes out into, into space would also be a military vessel. It would also be combat ready somehow. Orders, Scotty. That's what scares me. This is clearly a military operation. Is that what we are now? I thought we were explorers. Sign we... for the torpedoes, that's an order. I mean, scientists and explorers, but the ship already has phasers and torpedoes. I, I get I get confused in Starfleet because it feels like there should be a military wing and an exploration wing. And if you're in the exploration wing, you get minimal, you get self-defense, but that's nothing really beyond that. Where the military wing is like, we're ready to fight. 
It's weird that the exploration wing is also the military wing, and yet they're not military, but they're like, please don't arm my ship, but please arm my ship, but I am confused. It's right? Right. So my understanding of Starfleet in, or Star Trek, Starfleet, is mm -hmm. there are fully science vessels that are yep. like, we're like, we have no weapons. And then there's the exploratory science, and then also first contact vessels that mm -hmm. have phasers and photon mm -hmm. torpedoes and such. Yeah, I just don't, I don't understand what Scotty's objection is. So I guess, let's imagine we're an explorer in an unknown land. Okay. And we have a single pistol for self-defense. Maybe some body okay. armor? Okay. Maybe some body armor? Okay. So Shields, I'm, yeah. I'm go so I feel okay, like I'm there to exploration for peace. I need to be able to defend myself. So I carry a pistol, maybe put on some body armor, but maybe in 10 years, the new explorers are rolling heavy, AMRAP, uh, rocket launchers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, when did we transition from peaceful exploration with some self-defense to like rolling heavy, burning the forest down? But isn't that really a question of what your enemy combatants are like? Because if you if you go in there with a pistol and and any and like a body armor and everyone else has pistols and body armor, then yeah, you're your peer groups, right? But if everyone has like baseball bats and it's like, yeah, you're you're kind of you're kind of going heavy in there, right? But if everyone else has RPGs, then maybe I needs RPGs too. Yeah, but then I guess you're transitioning away from exploration <laughs> at that point. At mm -hmm. some point, there's a transition where somebody's going to be like, we're not exploring anymore were a military invading but, but that's the thing about space exploration is you don't know what you're going to encounter and in, because you don't know what you're going to encounter the enterprise as it is without the additional weaponry might look like to an alien species like oh you're a military group well, but for the things that we encounter for the way we design our ships this is actually self-defense so i think gosh if you're sending out exploration ships to alien worlds you want to give a i would imagine you want to come across as an explorer non-combatant you can have some defense but non-combatant and that's a good message to send instead of rolling heavy now there could be some miscommunication like you said mm -hmm. but having an exploration ship i think is the best move so if you start equipping exploration ships with heavy weapons you're, we're no longer doing the Right. So, so the question is what classifies as heavy? And I think that's just relative to whatever Scotty already has. And I think if you're, I mean this, oh gosh, if you're encountering alien species and you're totally soft and defensive, like you're like in a, like we have super strong shields, but you could probably push us into the ground. That's also mm -hmm. maybe not so good. Right? Depending, depending on the culture you encounter, like if you encounter the Klingons, they like, you know, you need to show your weapons because that's what they respect. But if you go to Ferengi and you're like, we got these, all these big guns, like, we don't care about that. What, what, is, what are you doing here? So I guess that's where it comes back to why don't we have a military division and an exploration division? Because the exploration is like, as soon as I get into trouble, I'm, I'm cutting and running. I'm running. I'm right. not going to fight. And then I'll tell the military people, like, that planet was hostile. You need heavier <laughs> weapons. Like, big brother, you know? go mess them up for me. Like, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, just if we're going to create contact with them, we need to be able to defend ourselves. The exploration right. ship wasn't going to cut it. So I guess I guess a good way around that is to have an exploration ship and a and a military ship fly together in parallel. But then you just you just put it on one ship. I would Let's want go. to send out the exploration ship alone. And that way, the first contact is not militaristic. And then if there's any problems, cut and run, get out of there. Mm, mm, mm. It's more to like send in your diplomats with some self-defense, but that's it. Do you see what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. And I think, honestly, I think the Sith do it right. <laughs> what? You send the, or the, you, yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. So during the empire, they would send these little um, like probes, little droids that are like, just go around, search the planet, come back, let us know what's up. So if Starfleet, if Starfleet did this, because we're, we're doing Star Trek right now. So if Starfleet yeah. did this, you'd, I, I would imagine, or what I would do is send out a bunch of autonomous droids, or autonomous probes, just go out everywhere, come back, let me know what's up. That might be step one. And then di diplomacy is step two, which would be like the mm -hmm. Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And then if you encounter the Klingons, then it's military. Call up the Defiant. Which doesn't exist yet, but yes. 
but the yeah the idea of a, a <laughs> combat specific ship right okay i'm done with that i like that mm -hmm. so this is after scotty is forced to quit by kirk and then he, kirk promotes Chekhov to head engineer what imagine being mistress. one of scotty's crew and being like who the <laughs> yeah, 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 let's watch it. You've been shadowing Mr. Scott. You are familiar with the engineering systems of your ship. Affirmative, you, sir. Good. You're my new chief. I'll put on a red shirt. So Chekhov is super smart. He's maybe 18 to 19 mm -hmm. now. It's been a little bit of time. But he goes from bridge crew and like a ju fairly junior person to head of engineering. But there were people in engineering that have already yeah. spent like a decade in there. And then he just leapfrogged all of them. Like, who th what the heck? What the heck? Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're in Starfleet, you say you're 40 years old, 50 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. You're talking two, three decades of engineering experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, starting at 20, you know, mm -hmm. two to three decades of engineering experience. And then the 18, 19 year old comes swooping in and is now your head engineer. You'd be like, I, what? I, I hate Who? this. I hate this place. I hate this place so <laughs> much. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, well, he's been shadowing the leader. Oh, he's been shadowing the leader. He's been shadow he's been shadowing. Does does Scotty he know out. my name? No, he doesn't know my name. No. That being said, <laughs> Chekhov does a good job, but also like I would be so angry. It, I it would be so angry. Well, who knows what's going on in engineering? There were problems throughout, and you mean, maybe you some mean of them problems throughout been in this in this movie. You mean? Yeah. Okay. I I thought the problems. I thought the reason they had problems was because Marcus sabotaged the ship. Right. To, to, maybe... to cause them to get stuck there. Right. But Scotty and his team may have noticed it with the bureaucratic chaos of the situation. It slipped. Mm, okay. Yep. You know, I mean, sabotage has two components, right? The sabotage and also the not noticing it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, does that mean there's a saboteur that is still active in engineering? Oh, shoot. That does mean unless right. it was like maintenance and that person's now off the ship, it could mean that there's a saboteur on the ship. <gasps> Possible. They never explore that. Never explore that. Like Kirk needs to think. Like oh, there could be a saboteur. We need to get a security detail on that. Mm -hmm. I think so. So this is cool space station design. Can we look at some of the elements here? Sure. This is. The, I, th oh, I think this is space dock one. I think so. Because I see the ball and I see the spokes. The yep. Desk and spokes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Some ships can dock underneath. Some go above this level. It's neat. It does seem a little inefficient in the number of ships, but that's okay, I think. Right. So from what I've seen from the Kelvin timeline, Starfleet is weak. So they're not yet worried about density because they, mm -hmm. they just don't have that many ships. Right. So they, they're like personnel and building ships is more important than like efficiency of design of the space station. I they're see. just not pressed for space yet. They're yeah. not pressed for efficiency. Mm -hmm. I also saw in a slightly different frame, there's this ship. What is this? Yeah, super weird. A red ship. I mean, that that looks like a saucer, right? Looks like a saucer. And it looks like the nacelles are the similar shape as Starfleet nacelles. Yeah. So I think this is Starfleet. But what is going on? Like, what is this? It's super weird. Well, I mean, it looks like Starfleet design because Starfleet design is saucer plus nacelles. Right. And it looks like science a science vessel that I've seen in other shows. Oh, really? But well, red? It's kind of, well, the Enterprise has like pylons with the mm -hmm, nacelles mm -hmm. on top. Whereas the science vessels have like a saucer with the nacelles much closer. That's what I've seen. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so for example, Picard, the Constellation, if mm -hmm. I remember, it was a saucer with two nacelles underneath. Yeah. As opposed to the enterprise that has these, these pylons that come out here. Right. So but red, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, a color, like whatever. It's just color. Right. But just, Starfleet made one hot rod. <laughs> what, what is this? Right. <laughs> Cause it's got typically the nacelles are on either side. I've never seen mm -hmm. three nacelles, one centered and then painted red. Cause it's a hot painted, rod. <laughs> I mean, the nacelles come up in different configurations. Sometimes I've seen like four. I've even seen one yep. that was two on top, two on bottom. And it was like a red thing in the middle. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, know, yep. I don't know what that is.
but it's, it's really bothering me that this is red because I don't I don't think I've ever seen any other Starfleet vessel painted red. So what's going on with this? Gosh, let's think in militaries today, they'll paint different things, different colors like based on... Stuff. Well, I was thinking a training vessel. Okay. So like drones, I think, are orange. Okay. So if you see a, if you see something flying around that's a drone that is for testing or for something that is peaceful, then it'll be If you be see orange. blue blue with yellow wingtips, it's blue angels. Blue angels. So maybe this is this could be maybe for show. It could be maybe for training. Okay. And so it's not that. actually for combat. And so the red is designating it's the hot rod. We do the flybys yeah. for delegates and stuff. This is the admiral's <laughs> private starship <laughs> for delegates. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe. maybe, I mean, now that I think about it, if you don't want to show VIPs like working vessels with all the clutter and stuff, you want like a vessel that shows off Starfleet's cool ships, but is ready to take them on board. Hmm. So this is your diplomatic ship. That's kind of cool. I buy it. Sure. Maybe. One, maybe. one possibility. 